once you see it, you can't unsee it. It intuitively makes sense why, you know, when you send your cousin a hundred dollars of Bitcoin, you're not pegging that to the price a month ago. You're saying, okay, I'm going to send you a hundred dollars. Here's a hundred dollars. And that UTXO shows up on chain. And when thousands of people do that every single day in different USD denominations, it's kind of crazy that we haven't talked about this before. I was explaining to you guys before we started recording. So a lot of my audience are finance uh, folks, and some of this terminology that we're about to talk about is probably something that they're not intimately familiar with. The first thing that I want to make sure that everybody is level set on the terminology is oracles. Uh, there's a thing called the oracle problem. And uh, I'm, I'm going to start there and see if you guys can just define this properly for folks so that they have a base uh, knowledge of just that definition alone. Sure. Yeah, Preston, I'll take that one. The, the basic way to understand the oracle problem is that a system does not know about things outside of itself, right? So in Bitcoin, it doesn't know who won the Alabama game last weekend, right? Uh, the Oracle problem is how do you, as trustlessly as possible, uh, input information about what's happening in the real world into a system like Bitcoin to decide the outcome of things that people want to transact on, whether that's a, a trade or a, or a bet or anything else like that. Yeah. And would you say, uh, as far as, uh, you, you don't require trust for somebody to mediate between the value of two different things. So like if we're talking Bitcoin versus the dollar or the Euro, like for that peg to occur, like we're trusting sometime, uh, some outside entity. So like from a practicality standpoint, where does that really apply uh, why this oracle would be important for somebody in finance. Yeah. Well, just thinking back to the creation of Bitcoin itself, right? So, so say you bank with Chase, right? Mm -hmm. Chase is the oracle about the status of their database and your account with them, right? Mm -hmm. So before Bitcoin existed, there was no way to, to, to have a decentralized distributed system, um, and not have any Oracle involved, but the parties still know the status of the system, right? So in Bitcoin, when you run a full node, you validate all the transactions that are happening across the network over the history of the, the blockchain. And uh, you don't have to trust anyone to know that you have the Bitcoin that you own. Um, and that, that gets us in an extremely long way, right? But it doesn't get us all the way to removing you know, trusted third parties from things that people do. The reality of it is that in today's world, uh, people still transact in dollars. People want to place bets on things. People have commodities contracts and other things that they want to settle in Bitcoin. And um, you know that oracle problem presents itself when you're dealing in things not denominated in Bitcoin, right? Yeah. And so for I mean for for a for a person in finance, it is a bit of a yeah, it's, it's a bit of a challenge to get your get your head around why this is a problem. Number one, because whenever you're trading, you know, you you go to the website, you check the price, and that's the price. You know, mm -hmm. but in the world that we're living in, this the trust that's been eroded, and in the Bitcoin markets particularly, there's not a central clearinghouse for the price of Bitcoin. Right, there is a global market with hundreds and thousands of different participants every day with different market depth and different spreads and prices and fees. So there is no single price of Bitcoin, which is one of the really interesting things that we've um, sort of tried to approach this with. Where I find it to be uh, really important for people to wrap their head around this Oracle idea is like, let's say I bought a call option and uh, it's that I want to be able to buy Bitcoin at the current price, $26,000 roughly right now today. I want to be able to buy it at that price one year from now. And this would be a derivative. Um, so what am I using for my reference rate, uh, six months from now when I'm looking at that derivative, when I'm saying, right. okay, well, it, the, the price on this exchange is saying it's 30,000. The price on this exchange is saying it's this price. And there's, and I'm relying on a person that's managing that exchange to tell me that that's that price or some entity that's telling me that it's that price. But how do you, how do you, uh, 
How does that become decentralized that somebody's not saying that price or some entity that's controlling that price is really kind of the right. essence of what we're getting at with oracles. Yeah, well, this this concept, uh, you know, at my day job, I run finance and operations for SFOX. And what we do is we aggregate pricing from exchanges and OTCs around the world. And something that we see happen, not every day, but on a fairly routine basis is significant market dislocations at a single particular venue. So you'll have 20 exchanges with one price, and then one of them has a, a significantly different price. This has happened at all the big name exchanges, you know, for brief periods of time, but it does happen, right? Mm -hmm. And and just understanding that concept of there's not equally distributed liquidity across the market at all points in time in a market like Bitcoin, where there is no central clearinghouse or or, or exchange, um, it it kind of necessitates this more decentralized approach of using the blockchain itself as the price oracle because that's where this genuine settlement activity happens and it, it is actually the clearinghouse for bitcoin is the bitcoin network so it it's gotcha. pretty interesting yeah one other terminology that i think we have to address before we get into this is just utxos i know for you guys that might be uh a little funny to think that that's a term that we have to cover but uh, for most people that aren't intimately familiar with the space, it's just a term that they've never heard before. And and the concept, I, I don't know if you can put it into terms. One example that that really resonated for me was just like uh, coinage or coins uh, when you have a dollar and it turns into four quarters and, and things like that to, so that you can explain it for people that they can kind of really wrap their head around what a UTXO is. Yeah, um, I'll give the the layman approach here. So the way that I think about it is imagine you have a Bitcoin wallet and it's a physical wallet sitting in your hand. You know, there there's a bunch of different bills in that wallet, right? Each bill, it doesn't have to be $5 or $1. It can be a bill of any size. Mm -hmm. So you've got a hundred dollar bill in your wallet. That single bill is a UTXO, right? And then you have your set of UTXOs. Everyone else has their set of UTXOs. When you add up all of those UTXOs that everyone else around the world's owns, that adds up to the exact amount of Bitcoin that exists in the world today, right? And when you spend a UTXO, you know, you've got your $100 bill, you go to the convenience store, you want to spend $3. You, you can't rip off a corner of the bill and hand that to the clerk, right? You have to spend the entire $100 bill. It splits into two new UTXOs. They get their $3 and then you get change back for $97. And that's you know, one UTXO is now spent and that becomes two different UTXOs. Same way you can combine them. You know, if you had to, if you had to spend a thousand dollars, you can combine multiple UTXOs together in a single transaction to spend a thousand dollars for something. So I think that's a, it's, that visual has always resonated with me. Okay. So now we've got these two really important terms, UTXOs and oracles defined for folks. Tell people about your discovery. Yeah, so I, I do like that um, analogy of using coins or bills for a UTXO. Um, if you want a little more technical way to think about it, you know, Bitcoin is a database system. Um, things in database are stored in rows of a database, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. And um, every time you make a new transaction, you're creating kind of new rows. And you can think of each row on the spreadsheet as a UTXO. It's just that in Bitcoin, you have to delete the old row. So it's kind of like the old row up there is kind of not active anymore. And you have like two more rows. Um, and these uh, transactions, they're all, you know, publicly available. They're on the Bitcoin blockchain. And one of the things I've kind of been passionate about for a long time is uh, data visualization. And um, I think it was about five years ago. Well, I started making these heat maps at utxo.live. Um, probably like eight or nine years ago now. And then of all the sorts, interesting sorts of things I saw in these heat maps, um, one of them was the USD price. So I, I've known that you could look at the heat maps by eye and see the Bitcoin price on chain for like, what, five years now? Was that that Starbucks meetup um, back in 2018, Daniel, when we saw that, I think. Um, so yeah, it's... It's something I've known for a long time, and I thought about all the different kind of creative ways I could write some kind of pattern matching or machine learning or, you know, I've been thinking about all the different ways I could have pulled out 
what I can see by eye. And um, just finally did it um, in January, early this year. Okay, so so for people that are trying to just kind of wrap their head around how profound this is, so you have all the transactions that have ever occurred throughout time uh, that are graphically being shown. And we're going to have some links to in the show notes for people to kind of pull up these charts and some articles that are written about this. But you can see like these uh, like wiggles in the in the chart that are brighter than the rest of the transactions. And uh, Steve, uh, for both of you guys, when you saw this for the very first time to start to show up, you knew immediately that that was in USD terms, that that was like the price action that was kind of manifesting itself in these in these patterns that you were graphically uh, displaying. Was it just immediate that you knew that that's what it was? I didn't know what it was at first. Um, you know, when you look at these heat maps, you can see things like uh, when miners get paid out, you know, the dust limit, you can see that people don't really transact very much on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I saw really interesting things during the Mount Gox collapse that I still don't quite understand. But then I saw, I think, um, starting in like 2012 or 2013, these really like faint traces. And then there was a bunch of them and they were all like wavy, but they were all co-aligned with each other and all parallel. And I was like, oh my God, is this it? Is this, is this really the USD price on chain right here? Um, so yeah, it was... It was kind of mind blowing at first. Um, I mean, there's tons of things about Bitcoin that just give me that like shot of joy that like restore my faith in humanity. Um, this is definitely one of them. It was just like, wow, uh, this is a it's a pretty big deal. This Bitcoin system that has like I don't know, it's like our main way of storing truth on Earth. It seems like, and now we have the Bitcoin price in there. So yeah, it was yeah. Um, it, it was just a great day seeing that. So you guys came up with a model that, uh, and, I, and you're going to have to help me out on the stat here. So like when we go back and we, and anybody can run this with the Python uh, code that you guys uh, wrote, uh, I could plug it into the node that I run and I can go back and you could say, Preston on last year on, on this day, what was the price of Bitcoin? And without referencing any exchange, but just looking at the, the Bitcoin blockchain, transactions in bitcoin i can figure out what the the dollar price is within which uh how much variance is is in that uh it's within about a percent yeah so on a normal 1%. day it'll be about you know between 50 basis points and one percent different from the the daily you know vwap price and that would be all the exchanges combined uh you're within uh 50 bips to 100 bips of that price um yep. What what date does this start manifesting itself that you can start seeing this in the blockchain itself? Um, so it, it started, I mean, I the thing I published, I, I published the price history back to July 20, 26, 2020. Um, sometime in July, you could see the emergence of USD denominated transactions becoming a lot stronger. Like I said, I mean, you can... If you look hard at those heat maps, you can see the price back to like 2012. And I wouldn't be surprised if UTX Oracle did work back, you know, to 2015 or 2016 or something. I just, I haven't tested it that far. Um, but yeah, the prices that we've tested since 2020, July of 2020 have been really accurate. And um, just, to, you know, one of the things I, you know, I get that question a lot, right? Accuracy. And I usually respond by like, well, what's the true price? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> show me the true daily average price. It's like, it's 1% away from what? Like, so it, all the other you know, models are off. Not yeah. right. And yeah, you, you so don't know, exchange, there is no reference rate. Right. Yeah. And like an exchange price, you know, we're normally talking about, let's be honest, we're talking about Coinbase, Binance. We're talking about these exchange prices. These are places where, where you pay money for Bitcoin and then you kind of have an IOU and a hope of being able to withdraw Bitcoin a week later. Um, is that what spot price is? Um, know. you know, it, so you yeah, are hardcore. I, mean, I love I can, this. <laughs> no, so I get, I, I mean, I get what people say. They're like, is it way off? You know, if it was like way off, then yeah, I mean, it's a fair question to ask. But once you start getting inside that one percent, it gets kind of cloudy about you know what yeah. the true price is. Yeah. I'm curious of uh, how you came up with the Python script. Is there AI here that that helped you model this, or like 
how did you guys uh, come up with the code to do this in, in very general terms? Yeah, so I have kind of a background in machine learning and I did some graduate courses in this and I've, I just think about, you know, do you want to use a neural network here or do you want to use some of this new stuff or do you just kind of want to do something simple where other people could actually understand how it works? And um, I ended up going with the simple route where it's kind of like, well, I call it a stencil method where if you think about a day where every transaction was in USD and you think it kind of like a bell curve of those transactions, um, you just see spikes, right? Just at like $100 and $10 and $5. So I created this stencil, which uses kind of the average frequencies in which people spend this stuff on Bitcoin. And then I just slide that stencil over each day. And wherever it kind of locks in, wherever it's maximized, that's what I use to um, estimate a price. Wow. Is that uh, Okay. Hey, me as a me as a non technical person, you know, I can I can open the Python file and it's it's well annotated and I can read through it and understand, you know, pretty much exactly what was happening. And it's only a couple hundred lines, right? And this is a it's a very simple thing for someone if you're if you're already running a full node to just you know to just run it yourself on your own local computer and get the output price. And it's it's a very cool experience. It's kind of on par with that first running a node and seeing the blockchain do the initial download of blocks from 2009 uh it's it's a very cool experience yeah i'm curious if you would just take the uh aggregate price from all the major exchanges and basically use that as your test uh like this is this is the price that it should be and then you do an ai model do you feel like you would have got as good of a result as this simple simplified approach that you took I think it's that same question again. It's, it's, you know, how would you really know what's more accurate? I mean, I think you could write an AI model that added a lot of complexity that was um, probably more resistant against someone trying to manipulate it. And that's something I think about a lot. It's mm -hmm. kind of like a trade-off between complexity and um, reliability. Uh, but you also kind of have understandability of the code in that trade-off too and like daniel mentioned earlier you know please everyone open up this python script um if you've never opened up a computer program before do it here i mean the, i put a ton of english words and explaining every single step of what i do i taught introductory computing at a major university for a while um i'm very good at kind of like teaching people how programs work like on the base layer like open it up. I think understandability of code is um, it's very important. Like we don't want a black box AI UTX Oracle yeah. because why would anybody trust that? Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so the there, same, there's just a lot of trade off there. Yeah, and the same logic applies to the rules of the Bitcoin, right? That's why it's 21 million. Anybody can understand that. It's 10 minute block times. It's not an AI generated thing to to sync up with the US time zones and okay, business is more rapid on, you know, 8 a.m. on a Tuesday. So we need faster blocks. And it's like, no, it's just 10 minutes, 21 million. Anybody can understand it. Because that's what you would get effectively if you did an AI model, is it would be taking into account a lot of these other things. Um let, so there's been a lot of naysayers. There's been a lot of people that are really excited about this in the comments of your of your post on Twitter where it was announced. Um, I would, I, I, I was would... surprised that there weren't more naysayers actually. <laughs> so I didn't mean to interrupt, but I was expecting, no, no, no. Uh, it was, it was I... it, for Twitter. It was, it was way positive. <laughs> for, it for was Bitcoin very Twitter. positive. Shockingly positive. Yeah. It was very yeah, positive. Sorry, President. I didn't... No, 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 no. Yeah. I, I love that. So I would say like, at least my, my read on people's comments was, this is really interesting. I don't know that if I was entering into a derivatives contract that I would trust this as my sole oracle. I would probably want this in concert with others that would be, you know, weighted a certain way or or whatever. Uh, I'm kind of curious how you guys see that uh, as the creators or discoverers of, of this. Well, from, yeah, Preston, from my perspective, I think Steve and I wholeheartedly agree that this is, Number one, this model is not perfect, and two, it's it, it's impossible to create a perfect model, right? 
uh, because the world changes and, you know, people's use cases change, you know, the, the, the threats that you're trying to protect against change once things are known. So, um, I, yeah, I, I would, I would not, uh, just blindly use the model for a, a multi-year million dollar derivatives contract at this point. You know, there's, there's more research that we can put into things. That being said, it's, it's been very consistent over a multi-year period and, and not having large deviations and, and extreme volatility. Uh, so I, I do think it's, it's quite robust. Um, but from, from a practicality, you know, usability standpoint, there are there are a lot of teams out there working on these types of multi oracle decentralized you know, DLC type solutions, and um, I, my hope at least is that you know this version of the model or a derivative version could you know serve as an oracle in those types of setups and and just help people to do more things in a decentralized way. Um, that that's not really possible these days. The example I like to give. For this, it's like, oh well, why don't you just use a, you know, use a three of five multi oracle centralized approach? And it's like, okay, well, you the oracles that you chose were FTX and BlockFi and Celsius and Voyager and fill in the blank other. And it's like, surely not all five of those are going to go away. And it's like, oh well, in the yeah. last year and a half, all those have gone away. Yeah, you know, and now you 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 can't settle your contract. Whereas if you had layered in the UTX oracle. It doesn't matter if all of those have gone away. You have this you have this fallback mechanism to rely on the on-chain data to where even if you're using a centralized venue, this is a great backup for you. Yeah. What what type of feedback have you guys received that was, in your opinion, pretty thoughtful or something to consider kind of moving forward ever since you uh, announced this? Um, yeah, like I said before, I've just been blown away at the the positive nature of the feedback. Um, a couple of people have um, shared some ideas about how to improve it. We had uh, a few people that actually ran a node for the first time um, in order to get this running. And I love seeing that. I mean, that's that's a yeah. big motivation of mine is just allowing people to do cool things with their node. Um, Daniel, did you did you get anything else? Hey, guys, I just wanted to jump in here quickly and tell you about today's sponsor. Few investments make a better long-term hedge against inflation, depression, and economic downturns than precious metals like gold and silver. And that is why I'm excited to tell you today about Noble Gold Investments. Noble Gold Investments is America's trusted provider of precious metals as they've secured over $1 billion in precious metals for their clients. They offer physical gold and silver coins, and they even let you invest in gold and silver through an IRA allowing you to not only protect yourself against economic calamity, but also receive tax benefits as well. Noble Gold Investments is not just a company. It's your financial guardian for life. It stands for integrity, efficiency, and the American way. And this month, with any qualifying precious metals IRA, you'll receive a free 5-ounce solid silver America the Beautiful Bullion coin. That's right, a free 5-ounce silver coin. Noble Gold Investments is here to help our listeners who want to invest in gold and silver. All you have to do is go to billionairesgold.com. That's billionairesgold.com to get this exclusive offer. No, I think it's, uh, yeah, the people that have initially seen the idea and it, and it really clicks with them, um, it, it kind of just makes sense. It's one of those things where once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it just it intuitively makes sense why, you know, when you send your send your cousin hundred dollars of Bitcoin, you're not pegging that to the price a month ago. You're saying, okay, I'm gonna send you a hundred dollars, here's a hundred dollars, and that UTXO shows up on chain. And when thousands of people do that every single day in different USD denominations, it's kind of crazy that we haven't talked about this before. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, when before you actually look at the data, you might just think, oh, OK, there's just a little bit more transactions right at these even amounts of dollars. It's way more. I mean, it looks like this giant. If you look at the bell curve, it's like a smooth bell curve. And then there's these giant pitchfork prongs sticking out that just go into the stratosphere. And it's like it's mm. very clear where $100 is like that's it's never a question. 
in my mind, especially for a human. I mean, it's a little bit harder writing the algorithm to pull it out, but a human would have no problem looking at the heat maps and telling you what the price is. Um, and yeah, along the lines of that, um, how robust is this? It's certainly new. Um, we've been doing it for a while. It's still probably in kind of a beta stage, but we thought it was a good enough idea and a kind of original approach that needed to be shared. Like me and Daniel were just like, you know, we shouldn't just keep this to ourselves. Let's just go ahead and release it. Obviously, it hasn't been tested in any kind of adversarial environment. Um, so who knows what will happen with that. But we just thought it was it was good enough to release at this point. And if a person w were to try to game this, like uh, walk us through how you would try to to game it if you were an adversary, just so we can kind of like as a thought experiment, kind of understand the, the vulnerability. There's a couple of things that just they might just happen over time natively without anyone trying to game it, right? If if the average transaction fee on Bitcoin is over a hundred dollars, then it's not going to make sense to send a hundred dollars to someone anymore. So that line would just you know mm -hmm. not be visible on chain anymore because people don't send in those round amounts of that magnitude uh a couple so hyper of the other so the answer is hyper bitcoinization would invalidate it with enough time exactly yeah Dude, that's we, a good point you just well, do the that... lines at ten thousand dollars we'd be fine yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know when, it'll when just bitcoin be a different price line. goes up like preston or like uh what's his name says uh um you know when bitcoin price goes up people just use bitcoin to send higher amounts of money and those yeah. lines would be even more crystal clear in my opinion it used to be anyway. you would send your friend one dollar a bitcoin and nobody sends one dollar a bitcoin anymore you send 10 yeah. or 50 or 100 right yeah um yeah. one other you know reasonable approach that someone might take is just to create a lot of utxos that instead of a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars you create you know a uh, hundred and seven dollars just to create more confusion in the model but for many reasons, I don't think that that would be an effective use of an attack because number one, you can add UTXOs to the to the Bitcoin data set and you can transact on your own. But this whole horde of other people that are just transacting in their daily lives, they're not going to stop just because you're attacking. right? So there, all yeah. you could do is create a second line with a slightly different price. And, um, and I don't think that you would overwhelm the entire global user base of of bitcoin in that type of attack and you can't get rid of their utx so all you can do is create a slight you know a slightly different line which you'd have to have a lot of money on the line to give you know to give it that much effort and cost well you'd be paying huge fees for doing something yeah. like that right right and by my estimate yeah. at today's rates it would cost you about seven bitcoin a day to to do this and another nuance to here about how this model works is we're taking the average price for this for the day. We're not just taking a single block's worth of you know, mm -hmm, UTX. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to create this signal over a full day. And if if a day's not long enough, you know, just wait longer. All right. Just do a three day or a seven day or a 30 day version. And that that just drastically increases the cost of attack to where uh, if you're if you're doing a, a year long options contract on chain, you probably don't mind taking the last month's average price for the settlement price. And you could do that very easily with this model. Yeah. Well, that's how a lot of these derivatives contracts are closed out. It's the close of business on Friday of this date on this month. Um, yeah. Your seven Bitcoin threshold is you're saying to basically wash out because Steve described it as basically like these peaks that really like stand out on the blockchain. Um, so you'd need seven Bitcoin per day to basically wash that out across the whole spectrum. It seems like it would, would be higher than that. Well, yeah. no, what you you'd be paying seven Bitcoin in fees just to create a second set of lines. Oh, got it. Okay. So that there would be rivalry. Oh. Okay. And then you also need you also need about a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin to to make those UTXOs as well, because you're gonna have to do you know, tens of thousands of transactions in a day that's going to use up Bitcoin to do that. So it's it's going to be fairly still, expensive. But I've seen the I've seen the chart, and you have lines at a hundred, you have lines at a thousand, you have lines at ten thousand. So you yeah. have to basically replicate the the one hundred and seven and the 
the one th- 1070 and the right so like right it seems like it even yeah you can't just manipulate saying. right yeah you can't just manipulate one line and think you're gonna fool it um but you know keep in mind when you are paying high transaction fees you are trying to crowd other people out so you know That's you know one person could essentially pay the entire fees and be the only person in the block so there's um there's that to add to it but that that might just be astronomical to think someone would pay the fees for all blocks in a single day but they might but you know i anyone who is really seriously considering using this for some high level contracts should have some kind of model of the uh cost of attack because that would give you kind of a natural price you know you wouldn't want to exceed in your contract or something like that the block fees are those are constantly iterating so if this type of thing were happening after 10 minutes the the entire bitcoin blockchain's fee model would kick in and everyone would be paying a higher fee so it's going to get exponentially more costly to to run this type of attack if you're running it you know actively to me it seems like the the signal in in the data is getting stronger with time is is that what you guys are seeing and so like if we warp 5 years into the future do you feel like this this signal or this peg to the dollar in the data is uh, this Oracle data is going to get stronger. Um, I've been surprised at how strong the USD round amount of patterns have gotten. Um, right now, I would predict it getting stronger, you know, in the long run, you know, hopefully uh, it's like a dating app that's designed to be deleted. Like hopefully, you know, USD isn't the major unit of account for the world in a hundred years, but um but right now, yeah, it's gotten stronger. It's that's been interesting. It's also interesting. So back in 2015, the brightest line was like the one dollar line, and then mm. it was the ten dollar line, mm. and um, now it's the hundred dollar line. Uh, so you know, maybe the brightest line will be a thousand dollars. So that's happening too. Um, yeah, not sure, but definitely, definitely getting stronger over the last few years. It's also just one of those things where Preston, you hit it dead on with, you know, hyper Bitcoinization, this line probably, the signal probably goes away because why transact in dollars if hyper Bitcoinization is here? And also if Bitcoin goes to zero, the line goes away because, you know, so either way it's going away eventually, but who knows how long that'll take. So uh, looking at the heat map, uh, one of the things that I found really fascinating and I I think I'm understanding the data, but correct me if I'm if I'm not. Uh, I I feel like I can really see the HODL waves on a, on the the chart behind you there, Daniel, in particular, um, where you can see where the the price in dollar terms kind of hit its its high, and you can see how people who were sitting on coins like just let them age as you go through this next cycle. Uh, I'm curious, a is that correct, and then b what imp, what data or what visual are you seeing beyond what we've already talked about that has just really been intriguing for you guys uh, by looking at, at all of this? Um, you're definitely right about that, the, the way you can see the hot waves and the charts. I mean, I like the triangle better than the hot waves chart, but that might just be because I'm more familiar with that triangle chart. Um, in terms of what other pattern, I'm sure I could think of something. Daniel, do you- do you, do you have anything in mind? Uh, I'll just say there are, this is not necessarily a, a modern thing, but uh, this concept of you know, Bitcoin archaeology or just like, you know, digging into the UTXO set and, and seeing the history of things that, are, that have happened. Steve has a really awesome chart that is annotated over the, the entire history mm. of Bitcoin's existence about interesting things that are happening, right? So there's there's the Satoshi coins, there's Satoshi dice, there's Mt. Gox, there's all these things that have happened. And then there's some other things that are very visible and distinct on chain, but they're still a mystery. You know, somebody was testing a wallet back in 2011 and they created a bunch of these UTXOs that are still there today and that, you know, in all likelihood will never, ever be moved. So they're just permanently there. Right. And there's, there's just, a, there's a lot of cool things you can look at in the history. Uh, yes, yeah, so utxo.live has some really great charts to explore that type of thing. Uh, we'll have to have a link there 
Okay, that's awesome. I, I did think of one thing that I am fascinated with is I have one, if you could go to UTXO Live slash um, changes, I think it is, uh, you can see what the distribution of ages of coins that were spent yesterday were. And uh, this distribution is fascinating. So, you know, you, you get things on Glassnode, kind of like, you know, the average holder is holding on for two years and this has changed, whatever. But if you, it, I think it's so much more fascinating to just look at that statistical distribution of how long people have been holding on to the coins they spent every day. You know, you'll see one or two coins that are spent from back in 2013 or, or 2012 or something like that. And then you'll see this kind of like bell curve um, in log space over amounts where like, you know, the mean is right at 0.01 Bitcoin and it kind of maybe the top of that bell curve goes back three or four years or something. And that makes me think about, you know, it, you know, this is kind of philosophical, but like, is there a sense of an average time preference of how people just act in general? And could something like the Bitcoin blockchain really tell us something about average human behavior in terms of time preference? Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of just like a more of a scientific question, but I'm interested in that. I love both of those. That's awesome. Uh, guys, uh, there's a lot of talk about ordinals and inscriptions and the mempool not clearing as uh, students of the blockchain, like deep students of the, of the blockchain. What are your thoughts on this new development that we've seen really kind of play out here in 2023? And is there any type of cause for concern uh, as, as far as the impacts that it might have on the longevity and just the, the use and the utility of the blockchain? I think from both of our perspectives, we're, we're largely just Bitcoin only, right? So I, I don't particularly have any interest in ordinals or inscriptions from a, a monetary perspective. I do like the concept of the, the numbering and just having a social layer of like, okay, we're going to number these UTXOs and do fun things with them. But um, yeah, I, I'm staunchly Bitcoin only from that perspective. And um, I think we'll probably talk about this more in a bit, but just changing the Bitcoin software has unintended consequences. And to claim that any type of change that you happen to personally want uh, and, and advocate for, uh, like I, I'm not advocating for any change in Bitcoin with related to, you know, with regards to UTX Oracle. The good news is it works today without any changes, which is, which is nice. Um, but yeah, yeah. I just think that people need to really be, be serious when they consider these things. And yeah, you know, there are going to be second and third order effects that we can't predict, you know, with, with inscriptions coming out of Taproot and other changes that people are talking about today. It's just, it's just kind of naive and foolish to think that we know all the answers about what's going to happen with changes in Bitcoin. So. Steve? Uh, yeah, I pretty much agree with Daniel on that. I'm, I'm more on the conservative side when it comes to changing the code. You know, I, I, I've been around forever. You know, I, I lived through the block size wars. I, you know, that was a deeply personal time about whether we thought Bitcoin was going to survive. Yeah, the, the changes people want today, they're just, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal um you know keep in mind like daniel said you know but for taproot nobody saw any problems with taproot um and then now we kind of have things that we didn't expect to come which may have come more from the segwit limit but yeah there's going to be unexpected changes uh you can't predict complex code uh really what's going to happen for it what you want to introduce into the code is probably not going to be how other people want to use it um so it doesn't really matter what you think the code can be used for. It matters like what else it can be used for. Um, but, you know, Bitcoin is, you know, I, I write software. I understand that you always kind of have to keep software up to date. Um, so it's not like total ossification, uh, but just a conservative approach. Well, there's just there's just so many greenfield areas of development that we have not exhausted or even come close to exhausting with with Bitcoin today, you know, there are, there are very few taproot specific applications in use today. And, uh, it just takes a long time in Bitcoin to do anything. And having a, having a long-term perspective is really necessary to keep, uh, 
your keep your head on straight, basically, because things are not going to happen on your time frame, and people just have to be okay with that. Doesn't mean you you can't work on things and and propose things and you know talk about it, but you can't expect it to change on your timeline. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you guys 100. Uh, percent. You know, I the thing I tell people is if if we truly want to change the direction of clown world like the only way we're going to do it is with sound money and money that's immutable and all the stuff that we talk about in bitcoin and tinkering with the code and and doing the the gee whiz swoopy thing that everybody's talking about in the moment is is just all risk to perpetuating clown world as far as i'm concerned so yeah yeah, i'm with you guys 100 percent um daniel you wanted to uh to talk about positive rationalism explain yeah. what you're getting at with this well i kind of ex- it's it sort of piggybacks on what you were talking about just now with not participating in the clown world you know you it's it's almost impossible to look anywhere in life today and not just shake your head and say like what in the world are we even doing you yeah. know how are these how do you consider these to be serious people who are doing a lot of these things and i think with bitcoin we have a good history of being seriously considerate people and because of that I am my and I think every other Bitcoiner I know, if you were to talk to a, a, a normie and say like, oh, what do you think about the Bitcoiners? They'd probably think that that you were a doomer and that you were pessimistic and you're like, oh, just burn everything down. It's like, but that's not how Bitcoiners actually live their lives. These are At people all. who are optimistic, you know, reasonably optimistic. We We don't think that there aren't challenges, but like I listened to your conversation with Guy, who's a good friend of ours as well. And, you know, Guy is really positive on the AI trend, mm-hmm. not for its centralizing effects, but for its decentralizing effects. And I feel the same way. Like with everything that happens to the negative side, luckily there are extremely positive things happening as well on the on the social layer, on the personal layer, on the the, the business layer that uh, you just have to open your eyes and participate in these things to really see how important they are. But uh, but yeah, that's where I come at it is there are so many good things happening in the world that kind of get swept under the rug because they're not maybe as fun to talk about as the sensational headline. But I'm I'm very optimistic for the future of the world and for my family. And I think that that's very common with Bitcoiners. So. Amen. Amen. Steve, did you have anything to add on that one or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, Daniel's really good at at speaking about that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin. Uh, really, there was a time in my life for sure. You know, 2013, 2014, 2015, um, where it was like Bitcoin is really the only thing I think um, is true and and is kind of like optimistic. And that's the reason I held for so long. To be honest, uh, people think holding through the bear market's hard. I mean, it's it's not hold to hard through the bear market when you feel like this is like the greatest path forward for humanity. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty easy. Um, but yeah, you, definitely you on board with that under- rational optimism. You have to understand it for the essence of what it's trying to accomplish to right. look at yeah, it through yeah. that lens. Like if, if you stepped into this purely because you were trying to make money on number go up and then like you're not here for like the actual mission of what it's trying to accomplish. I think the bear markets just wreck havoc on the people that are here for all the wrong reasons. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and that that's the situation I found myself in back when I first got into Bitcoin was I saw number go up and immediately after I bought number went down right? <laughs> for, for a long time. <laughs> and, you know, you ask, you get to a point where you have to ask yourself, like, why, why do I own this thing? And so you start asking the questions that everyone asks and turns out they're really good, solid, considerate answers for these questions. And, you know, uh, another thing that we were talking about earlier, Preston, about, you know, this this orange pill culture of, of like, yeah, I, I sat down with my neighbor and I orange pilled him. It's like, guess what? That's not going to stick. You know, you can't just tell someone to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, it takes weeks and months and years in some cases to really internalize why this is why money and having a good money is such a big deal. And it it doesn't just stop at money. It, it affects your personality, your your life, your family. You know, it affects the world. And this is not a trivial thing here that we're embarking on. Yeah. 
that I was talking with Jimmy song recently and he, he got into like the cultural rot that really kind of manifests itself through fiat. And I just find it to be so true and so important and just at a much deeper context than I think most ever would even give it the time of day to have that conversation. But, you know, when you really pull the thread, it's just, it is just fiat in general is just wrecking havoc on society at large globally all over the place. But yeah. uh, Daniel, you have a very interesting quote on Twitter and I've got to ask you about it. You said it's very short. You said clocks didn't create time. What are you saying here? <laughs> well, I was, I was getting a little philosophical over the weekend and uh, just thinking about, Number one, thinking about an, an analogy for how to explain to people the UTX Oracle concept, but just the fact that when people say, oh, what's the price of Bitcoin? You look at your, your venue of choice, but that doesn't mean that's the price of Bitcoin, right? Time existed before we had clocks and the price of Bitcoin existed before there were centralized exchanges, right? Um, so just, just trying to... Uh, just trying to conceptualize the fact that uh, there is not a particular price of Bitcoin, and if you if you like using the UTX Oracle model as the price that you're using for whatever you need, you know, go for it. This is a this is a method of doing that that doesn't rely on a centralized party. Um, but yeah, it's a uh, that that's pretty much where I was going with that. And it's uh, I, I we had a side conversation about this and there's a, a a group of people that talk about Bitcoin and time and it's, it can get a little confusing and you can get wrapped around the axle. So I'm not trying to go too deep with the time thing. Uh, but, but just the fact of there is no Bitcoin website, right? There's not even a single version of the Bitcoin software. There's Bitcoin core and there's other versions that, you know, core is the main version people use, but there is a single Bitcoin blockchain, right? And th that's the only real reference we have to Bitcoin is the blockchain and the UTXO set. Everything around that changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if people are looking for an article on Bitcoin and time, Gigi has probably one of the most uh, eloquent, just thought provoking uh, <laughs> articles yeah. there are, which we could have in the show notes as well. Um Last thing that I want to talk to you guys about is just meetups. And uh, I think, it was it Steve or Daniel that, that you guys were talking about the various ideas that still need to be sh shaken out, uh, smelting, the 2106 mm -hmm. time bug, uh, things like that, and how you're able to chew on ideas and interact with other people with local meetups. Uh, give us some of your thoughts on this. Uh yeah, I would love to have one comment on that. And Steve, I, I think it'd be great for us to touch on the 2106 if, if you'd like to, just for a few minutes. Okay. Um, I, from the Raleigh Bitcoin Meetup crew, it, it's just such a phenomenal group of guys and people that uh, for, for years and years at this point have just um, been consistently meeting up. I mean, I, I used to live in the area and uh, it was essentially like every night of the week there was a different Bitcoin meetup you could go to. It was It was great, you know? And these are all just normal good people who care about Bitcoin who are just genuinely interested in talking about it. You know, there's a there's a lot of people in the space that you you kind of reflect back on your time and you think, wow, has there been a day in the last X number of years that I didn't think about Bitcoin? And there if there are any, they are very few and far between, right? Because it's just the most fascinating concept in the world and it really keeps your attention for longer than most people can say about anything else um and i think bitcoins are probably the best you know nurturing ground for that it's the place where you can go and ask the ridiculously stupid question that you're afraid to ask elsewhere and bitcoiners are you know they they have a a, a gruff online presence but they're extremely nice people and will help you in anything and that's their favorite thing to talk about so they're they would love nothing more than you to come to their meetup and, and talk about Bitcoin with them. So, uh, yeah, the Raleigh crew has a great, uh, a great meetup scene. And I'm in Nashville now, and we have a great meetup scene here as well. So, um, pretty epic. Just the, in, in the ideas that come up in the meetup scene are really phenomenal. We've had a couple in the Raleigh group. Um, I'll, I'll give a quick plug to Smelting. It's a, it's a, 
it's a an idea that really doesn't happen right now and it does have some serious drawbacks um with with block reorgs but it's essentially uh, a way to coordinate with a miner to spend a utxo and then get a new utxo from the coinbase transaction so you end up having a utxo with fill in the blank whatever history yours had that's getting chain analysis run on it all the time and then you end up spending that one and getting a fresh new utxo from a coinbase that was created from nothing and uh you do that through paying a, a really high fee to a miner and uh yeah it's it's a pretty cool concept and it 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 makes a lot of the chain analysis stuff a lot harder and maybe impractical so mm. um that's my point about there are there are a lot of privacy and scaling and other techniques that we have available to us today if the need arose that we just really haven't developed enough to pursue other types of changes to the core protocol. Hmm. Uh, Steve, did you want to talk the 2106 time bug? Um, sure. Yeah. Daniel, thanks for giving a shout out to the Raleigh meetup. You moved away and you're still putting out ads for us. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, Alumni credits. Yeah. We got a good group there. Um, but uh, yeah, so 2106 bug, I don't know. You know, I, I think about what do I want to work on? Like, how do I want to like, contribute to Bitcoin? Um, I think the best improvements to Bitcoin code are ones that actually solve bugs, uh, make things more efficient. Adding features, you know, uh, okay. But, you know, there's there's an actual bug out there um, that's going to happen in 2106. If you run UTX Oracle.py, um, I print out a display with kind of like the progress or whatever. And one of the things in that display is the 32-bit time field in the block header, um, which is a problem uh, it, because in 2106, those 32 bits fill up with all ones. Um, so we do need to figure out a way to get past that. And I, I you know, I'm a, part of me is like, oh, it's, you know, it's, we got plenty of years to do this. Like, who cares? But then I hear people coming on podcasts talking about like, well, we have to hard fork anyway because of 2106. Therefore, we should consider these other changes. And I feel like this is a... It, one, it's not really accurate, and also it's kind of dangerous. So I was thinking maybe I should just start kind of like working on this problem. And I've seen Greg Maxwell and a couple people post very kind of like easy, simple solutions to this. Um, and so I don't know. I just thought I'm probably going to start working on that problem next. I love it. You're describing like pork barrel, like politics, but for uh, Bitcoin updates where people just want to throw in everything, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, now we want to do drive. It's deep down in that. the weeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Guys, I really enjoyed this. I learned a ton. I am, I am way less skeptical as to the vulnerabilities to this after talking to you guys than going into the conversation, to be quite honest with you. I'm, I'm very curious what people listening to this might uh you know what their opinion might be afterwards make sure you guys comment uh you know when we release the show on twitter and and let these guys know your thoughts or concerns and highlights uh because this is really exciting it's a amazing discovery uh and kudos to you guys for pulling this off and and writing the code that people can go and run right on their nodes and never have to reference an exchange ever again than what the price of the dollar was <laughs> at any moment in time so uh bravo yeah. Give people a handoff to if they want to learn more about you or more about this. Uh, Steve, go ahead and, and throw it out there first. Uh, yeah, you can find me. I'm um, Steve Simple on Twitter. Um, but go to the website, uh, utxo.live. You can click on Oracle at the top there and open the Python script. You don't have to go to GitHub to look at software. It opens in a website. Uh, I don't love GitHub. It's a scary <laughs> place. Uh, you can open utxoracle.py in your browser on the site utxo.live and just read it. It's written in English, mostly. Daniel? Yep. Uh, yeah, on Twitter, I am Daniel L. Hinton. And uh, yeah, I would just encourage people to participate in your life. You know, if you're interested in Bitcoin, run a node, go to a meetup, uh, think about it, come up with ideas that you think could make it Bitcoin better or, or use it differently because, yeah, there, there are a lot of very fun things. And honestly, this has been a very enjoyable process. It's so, so much fun hypothesizing and theorizing about these things. And yeah, I'm just glad I get to do it with uh, such good folks. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. This was a blast. Thanks, Preston. Thanks, Preston.
only the giant corporations are going to have this and anybody less than a billion dollars, these won't exist. And that was scary. I was like, this could undo what Bitcoin is doing unless we get ahead of this. Luckily, I actually now think that despite the fact that there will be elements of centralizing forces in AI, this will contribute more to the diseconomies of scale of the giant corporate setup and the government institutions in the sense that the bigger you are, the less it helps you.